entire Bible is all about looking to Jesus. And some would think it's a peculiar thing we do as Christians, obsessing ourselves with Jesus. But there's a reason for it. It's because Jesus Christ has rescued us from our sin. He's rescued us from our brokenness. He's rescued us from our fallenness. And he's rescued us from the righteous judgment of a God who is a consuming fire in his justice. And so Christians respond with joy at what Jesus has done. We respond with gratitude like you would respond to someone who paid a debt that you owed that you could never pay with worship, gratitude, thanksgiving, and worship. That's what the whole Bible is drawing us toward, to look to Jesus, to see him for who he is. If anyone's not a Christian, they're not a Christ follower, you know why? It's a really simple reason. They haven't seen Jesus for who he is. So, so they say, um, th- yeah, I'm not going to make the defining, identifying mark of my life and existence about Jesus. Um, it'll be about something else. Maybe what I want it to be, my career, my pleasures, whatever. But a non-Christian is someone who just hasn't seen Jesus for who he is, for what he's done for what he's offering to a sinner. But a Christian is someone who's had their eyes opened to see that they were a sinner in need of a savior and Jesus is that savior. The preacher to the Hebrews is seeking to draw his audience's hearts and minds to that reality. Look at Jesus. And if you see him for who he is, you will not possibly be able to turn away and to run away. Consider Jesus. Last week, we're in Hebrews chapter 12, this New Testament book which started out as a sermon preached and then became a letter. Someone went to rev.com, took the transcription of that sermon uh, and turned it into a letter and emailed it to all the churches 2,000 years ago. And We're coming towards the end of it. And the chapter before, which Joey put on a master class of exposition last week, showing us what is faith. And not only what is faith, but what does faith produce? In Hebrews chapter 11, we saw the hall of faith. And we learned that faith is a whole person commitment. It's the entrustment of everything you are to everything that Jesus is. Joey showed us kind of walking through Hebrews 11 that faith believes what it can't see. That's what makes it faith. It's it's believing what is not visible. It looks forward to what God has promised while rejecting the lesser pleasures that this earth offers. Remember we saw um, some people in Hebrews 11 who were like, I'm going to suffer with Jesus because I want what he can offer in the future rather than just enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Faith believes what it can't yet see, but it trusts the promise of God, rejecting these temporal pleasures for, for what is coming and therefore true faith endures to the end. to to receive what it's hoping in. And Joey finished kind of just, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm not upset. (laughs) Just kind of stepping on my sermon a little bit. So when he says, I'll preach Hebrews 11, I I just think he's going to preach that chapter, but it's fine. He did finish going into chapter 12, which is fine. Although I would just point out, uh, self-control is a fruit of the spirit. But but he showed us that faith is looking at its object, Jesus. 
Faith is looking at Jesus. So in Hebrews chapter 11, we saw this hall of faith. And really what it was, was the preacher took us on a tour through history, looking at the faith of our Christian ancestors. So the preacher is trying to encourage his contemporary audience, guys, have faith, don't let go. So then he takes them on a tour through the corridors of history. Let's go look at this family we're involved in. And it is a family, because if you, if you have your Bibles open, look at chapter 10, verse 39. He's just come off of the heels of saying, man, it's a horrible thing if you shrink back and let go of your faith. But look at 10, verse 39. We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. The faithless will be destroyed. But we are the, of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We are of those. We're of the family of faith. We're of the family of believers, the ilk of believers. He really wants them to take pride in their family name. You're a McCoy. Act like a McCoy. You don't marry a Hatfield if you're a McCoy. Take some pride in who you, in who you are. Maybe you've, um, we've kind of lost some of that in our culture that rich, you know, cultural identity. But um, maybe some of you have, have a grandfather who says, you're a smith, act like it. You know, and, and what he's trying to get you to do is, remember who you are. You're of a long line of smiths. Behave like a smith. Well, what the preacher here is saying is, you're not of the family of non-believers. You're of the family of believers. So let's go look at that family. And so he launches into chapter 11, a biographical look at their family tree. And in doing that, um, remember, this is a sermon. This preacher has given his hearers a bit of a break. Um, a sermon is an experience, and, and sometimes I'm calling you to do something. Sometimes I'm calling you to think about something. Sometimes I'm calling you to respond as a preacher. And this preacher gives his hearers a bit of a break for this entire chapter of Hebrews 11, he just talks in the third person. He's talking about other people. Look at him. R remember her? Remem remember that group there? Remember how they held on? He he's looking at others. And um, he's doing that with an aim to do something with his contemporary hearer, but he's taking their minds to someone else. And I don't know if this is why, but it's often easier to learn a lesson when we're thinking about how it applies to someone else, right? Let's consider Moses. He went through a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And man, he, he gave up a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he did, but he held on. Man, that's so good. Um, so you should hold on. Oh, this applies to me. This is a lesson for me. So what the preacher does in chapter 12 is he comes back now to, to communicate directly to the listener. He goes immediately, now, this has something to say for us. Looking at them has something to say for us. I, I like what one man said. He said, now the preacher's tone changes and there's nowhere for anyone in the congregation to hide. He's just walked them through the hall of faith and now he's turned back and said, okay, now let's talk about your faith. Um, I'm, I'm going to frame this chapter around two points. An unshakable faith and an unshakable kingdom. And what he's done is he has just shown us person after person who possessed an unshakable faith. They held on to their faith in the Messiah no matter what. And it got pretty dramatic, didn't it? I don't know if Joey faints when he like sees blood, so he didn't really emphasize this one a ton, but he talked about people getting sawn in two because of their belief in the Messiah. And so rather than letting go of their faith in the coming Savior, they said, yeah, I guess you're going to have to cut me in half. That's pretty unshakable, right? That, that's, pretty, that's pretty let go. I'm not going to let go. We'll cut you in half. Okay, but I'm not going to let go. Unshakable faith. 
So we've just walked through a quarter of unshakable faith, and now the focus is on your faith. And the author to the Hebrews, this preacher, wants to show you that Christianity, in its essence, is possessing an unshakable faith in an unshakable kingdom. That's the message. Beginning in verse 1, let's consider an unshakable faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The race metaphor. It's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, it, it follows us through this chapter, actually. And the, the preacher never quite shakes this idea of faith being a race we run. You, you see that in, um, chap- in verse 11. He talks about training. Um, he, he's, he's in verse uh, 13, he talks about paths. Um, training is gymnazo, the, the gym. And paths are these, these paths that runners would run down. Uh, verse 14 is striving. The race, the runner is striving. There's this metaphor of faith, the, the life of faith being a race. And he says, because we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us endure in this race. So you can imagine the scene. Who's a runner? Jack, Jack is a runner. Um, and your buddy, what was your name? Chris is a runner. Any other runners here? Okay, you're all psycho. Play a sport that has like a goal or something. I never understood. So a runner in a race, tell me if this is true, Jack or Chris. Um, it gets really tiring and exhausting when you run. And know from experience. But there's something that happens when you turn that corner and you see the last stretch coming and you faintly see the finish line and around that finish line are hundreds of people and you begin to hear them and and they're cheering and they're looking in the distance and they see you and the moment you turn, you hear this roar of, there they are, and they're cheering for you and something surges through your body, doesn't it? this adrenaline uh, of encouragement because you see others, others uh, urging you on and, and cheering for you on. That's what's happening here. He's saying, look at the crowd and not only are they bystanders, but, but they've gone before you, they've run the race, they've finished the race and now they've turned and they're looking at you and saying, come on, you can do this. And the author is wanting a surge of spiritual adrenaline to go through their souls, to urge them on to keep running. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, oh, let us keep running with endurance. Lay aside weights and sins. In other words, lay aside everything which would keep you from running this race. Um... the weight and sin, we could spend time there. I, I'll, I'll just note this. Not everything that is a hindrance to your Christian life is in the category of lawlessness. We need to think strategically about how we're going to run this race, this difficult race. And the author here says, let those who've gone before, um, this would be a good exercise, go back and look at the lives of those in Hebrews 11 and say, what did they give up in order to run this race with endurance? They gave up a lot. And some of it would have been legitimate. Like Moses could have argued, well, can I like, believe in the Messiah and be Pharaoh and kind of have all the money? Like, yeah, okay, I guess. I mean, Joseph did it. Yeah, Joseph did it. But he laid it aside because he knew it would be a hindrance. So he's wanting to urge them on in this race to, to look forward, to, to be spurred on by these this cloud of witnesses. But then think of this. Okay, here, we're, we're back running again. And if you just turn the corner and you're getting closer to the finish line. And so you're starting to see the faces of the people at the finish line. And isn't it a special moment when there's a crowd and you see some of your friends, but then there's that one person that sticks out. Your mom or your dad or your crush or whatever. And, 
and another address, another story. Because even amidst all these people that are so encouraging to you, dad came. Dad's, dad's watching me. And so you're finishing that race just looking at him singled out amongst the crowd. It's a moving picture, and it's one we've experienced, and that's what the author does. He says, going on from verse 1, this, not only is this great cloud of witnesses urging you on, but verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The author points out that special attendee, Jesus Christ, who he himself has run this race, and he also is urging you on who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He's urging you on. I've said this in the past. I love these just statements, looking to Jesus. Verse three, consider him. If we could just pause there and think, the Christian life is a contemplation of Christ. Look to him. And what do we see when we look at Jesus? We see that he endured. And guys, he endured a lot. Despised shame, he was shamed. Um, Endured from sinners such hostility against himself. You see that phrase in verse three? What an interesting phrase. You could really sit there and, and just allow yourself to reflect on that. He allowed himself to endure from sinners hostility against him. The creator entered the creation and allowed the creation to despise, spit on, and crucify the creator. There's so much in that. And yet he endured it. The agony, the humiliation, the coming down to be killed. Because he considered the joy of heaven a greater reward. But not only the joy of heaven for himself, but the joy of heaven with all those he would bring with him. You and me. We're to consider him. L- look at the end of, or the second part of verse three. Consider him so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Man, what, what an encouragement to stiffen your resolve. To go back to the running metaphor, maybe you're turning the corner and you're a bit dehydrated. You're definitely tired. Your right leg is on the verge of a serious cramp. And even though you see the finish line, you say, I can't make it. But then you see those who've gone before you and they made it. And they're going, come on. And then you see, you see the one who you look to the most, who you love the most, he made it. And he's saying, come on. And and you begin to think, I can, I can do this. Stiffen your resolve, Christian. Look to Christ who endured. (laughs) Um, Stop, stop the pity party. Look at what he endured. Look at verse four. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You know what he's saying? Jesus did. He went through more than what you've gone through. And he made it. You can make it. Keep running. Keep running. Endure the persecution. Endure the temptation. Endure the difficulties. Something interesting happens here in this chapter. Okay, if you've been following with us in this study, you remember the context. The Hebrew people, the Hebrews to whom whom he's writing, were Christians who'd left the Jewish tradition and are suffering for it. And so some of their stuff's being taken, some of their own family members are persecuting them. So they're getting persecuted from the outside, from, from everything they've known. The other scenario that we've seen here is they've been tempted by their own sin sin toward uh, just sensual delights that the world has to offer, and also the sin of doubt. Eh, Is Jesus really worth it? And so to this point, when Joey and I have been preaching this, we've been harping on endure through persecution and temptation. But he introduces a different kind of endurance here. Notice what he says in verse five. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. He introduces another element of their suffering, and it's the discipline of God. (laughs) 
Verse six, the Lord disciplines the one he loves, chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us. We respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. He wants them to have unshakable faith that endures, and what he's calling them to do is to endure through not only the persecution and temptation, but to endure through the discipline of God. It's an interesting um, element that he's introduced here. You mean to tell me that some of their difficulties that they're experiencing are from God? I, I think we would be tempted as we go through this book to think God's wanting to rescue them from all the difficulty. Oh, if only I could rescue you from the difficulty of having to resist temptation. If only I could rescue you from the difficulty that your, your former uh, loved ones are, are bringing upon you. But then here, he, he says something almost shocking. I think many of us would receive it in a shocking way. Wait, God's the one who's disciplining and he's calling me to endure that? Why doesn't he just take it away? Well, you know why he doesn't take it away. Because nobody likes a spoiled child. Nobody likes a brat, right? And so he introduces this idea of Wait, wait, you're God's children, aren't you? Yes, so he needs to discipline you for your good. No one likes a spoiled child who's a menace and a nuisance. Not even the child himself. It's a miserable thing to be ignored by your parents, left to your own devices with no loving adult to discipline and, and guide you and care for you. Uh, but some of these Christians apparently had forgotten that because in verse 5 he says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons that, that the Lord's, he's not going to ignore you. He's not going to spoil you. He's going to treat you like a child, which means that the life of faith is a life riddled with discipline. It makes me think of 1 Peter 1. Remember 1 Peter 1? Um, Peter is talking to a very similar group of people out there s struggling and suffering. And in the opening verses of 1 Peter 1, he tells them, he reminds them about this glorious salvation they have. But then he says in verse 6, in this salvation you rejoice, though now, if for a little while, you have been grieved by various trials. And if you know that verse, you'll get a free coffee this week at Steeple House, if you can quote it. But you'll, you'll be grieved by various trials if necessary, so the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, those tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ. Wait a second, what do you mean? We've been given this glorious salvation, but now it has to be tested um, to, to prove its worth? Yes. The Lord is saying, I, I test your faith to see if it's genuine, and, and I do that through, through discipline. Um, I, really, I really find helpful what, what one scholar says on this. Listen, listen to this. When we as Christians find ourselves thwarted or disappointed, opposed or vilified, or even subject to physical abuse and violence, we may in faith be able to hear the gentle and wise voice of the Father urging us to follow him more closely, to trust him more fully, to love him more deeply. Suffering can be the trowel which digs deeply in the soil of our lives so that the plant of righteousness, a life of settled commitment to live as God's new covenant people, may have its roots deep in the love of God. See what he's saying? There are times when the Lord will allow suffering and even bring discipline in order to train you to value him, to love him, to cherish him above all else for your good, for your good, so that you would not be spoiled by the 
pleasures of this world and forget him for your peril. Does that make sense? He's a loving father. So um, a quick aside on this discipline of the Lord. Um, The Lord disciplines his children And though it feels painful, verse 11, oh, it feels painful, it has a purpose. And that purpose is that, verse 10, we may share his holiness. Verse 11, that it would yield the fruit of righteousness. In other words, when God allows discipline to enter your life as a Christian, it's not meaningless. It's doing something. And so what the preacher's trying to get these Hebrews to understand is that, yeah, life is hard and it's riddled with difficulty. And instead of that drawing you away from God, you need to realize the blessing that discipline is in your your relationship with God. He's showing you what's truly valuable. He's he's causing you to, to see his worth as your possessions may be taken away or as as your temporal delights are are taken away to see that he is worthy of more worship and more more loyalty than anything in this world our suffering at times our discipline is doing something namely it's 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 conforming us into the image of Christ it's making us holy, drawing us closer to him. And the motivation for that is love. Look at verse six. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. It's a gracious thing for the Lord to discipline like a father who disciplines their child so he doesn't run into the street of a busy highway. So what we see here is um, the preacher is urging these Christians to follow in the, in the example of all those who've gone before, looking to Christ, who himself endured the, the difficulties that Christ went through weren't because God the Father didn't love him. It was because he did love him. And so we're called to follow the same path as Christ. Okay, so um, in verse 12 through 17, he kind of gives one last surge of application and says, therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees. Again, you can think of the runner kind of dragging their knuckles and their knees are wobbling. And he says, no, 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 pick it up, make straight paths. Um, Don't, don't give up. Um, Strive here. And, and the striving is for peace with everyone and for holiness. Strive. Um, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Um, This whole book has been about don't ignore the grace that God is showing you by by rejecting Jesus. And it's interesting. He he brings in this example of Esau in verse 16. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. Really at the heart of this, at the heart of this message, we could go into so many of the different facets here, but to see this simplistically, what he's saying is, don't do what Esau did. What did Esau do? Remember what Esau did? Esau received as the firstborn the inheritance of Isaac, the blessing of God. He was going to get all of it. He was going to get his father's blessing. He, as the oldest son, would inherit everything. That's a massive blessing. But in a moment of weakness, coming in from hunting, he saw the stew that Jacob was making and said, give me the stew. And Jacob says, well, I'll give you some, but give me your, give me your inheritance. And Esau says, okay, fine. Have my inheritance. I'll take the stew. He, he traded something of massive worth for something of very temporal fleeting value. That's the lesson of Esau. His birthright for a meal, the inheritance of God for temporary pleasure. And what the preacher is saying is, don't do what Esau did. Don't escape the temporal sting of God's discipline and forfeit eternity in glory. Really, to put the book of Hebrews in a negative phrase, 
the whole book of Hebrews is urging you not to be like Esau, who, as one man said, was lured into the death trap of short-term pleasure, a single meal. Don't be like Esau. Don't spurn the offer of God's grace for short-term gratification. So Christian, that's the message for them and it's the message for you. This life is hard. Sometimes that pain is the Lord disciplining you because he knows what's good for you. Like when a little child cries and goes, Daddy, let me run into the street. And the daddy says, no, no, and disciplines. And the child goes, I don't like this discipline. Um, what he's calling them to do is, yeah, life can be riddled with discipline. It can be riddled with persecution and temptation, but endure because the eternal reward is worth it. And what these Christians are tempted to do is go, no, let me give up eternity just to get away from this temporal discomfort. Does that make sense? And it's the same temptation we have. It's the same temptation we have because we become so short-sighted that we say, if only I give up this Jesus life, I'll have, um, I'll, I'll escape this persecution or I'll gain this pleasure. And the preacher me, in this case, is saying, don't do that. It's not worth it. That's like Esau, giving up the inheritance. And if you read that account in Genesis 27, remember what, how Esau responds? When Jacob gets the blessing, he runs into his father, lays upon his father, and weeping, can't you bless me? Can't, don't I have something? No, I gave it to Jacob. There's nothing for you. And that will be the response of unbelievers in the final day. They will stand before God and go, oh, wait, I don't get heaven? No, because you gave up heaven for life on earth, for, for that pleasure. Remember those girls? And remember that money? And oh, remember the reputation you really wanted? And it was worth more to you than Jesus. Remember that? That was your heaven. No, but isn't there anything? Isn't there any heaven for me? And if you read that account in Genesis 27, because Jesus, because, um, Isaac responds to, to Esau. It's very heavy because then he goes on to curse Esau. He actually curses him. And if you imagine the scene, you can think of Esau weeping and holding and say, Dad, stop. Close your mouth. Stop speaking. No, 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 Dad. Stop, Dad. And he just, the, the curse comes out because it's all that's left for Esau because he gave up the inheritance. It's a powerful picture. Though he tried to repent with weeping, there was no repentance for him. So the preacher's saying, and I'm saying to you, because what God is saying to us is don't trade the eternal for the temporary. Hold, hold on to an unshakable faith, which helps you understand in Hebrews 11 why the guy was like, yeah, go ahead and saw me in half. Because he was looking with eyes of eternity. Does that make sense? Okay, this is where um, we turn to an unshakable kingdom. Uh, well, I'll say this. Unshakable faith sees that reality, sees life in the paradigm of Esau, okay? If I, I could have you guys leave looking at your life like you never have before. I don't think any of you have ever looked at this world in the paradigm of Esau. So go out from here tonight when you go to Dave's Hot Chicken or El Venado and look at your life through the paradigm of Esau. I don't want to be like Esau. My flesh sometimes tempts me to be, I don't want to be Esau. I don't want to trade. And unshakable faith sees the world that way. Unshakable faith gets this perspective. Unshakable faith sees Jesus and follows him through suffering. Now, the preacher could be done there, but he's not. So in verse 18, he says four, because he's building. He's still building his case. And now he introduces an unshakable kingdom. And this is where I'm going to ask Joey to come up and preach the rest of the sermon. Just kidding. This, this part, um, th there's a lot going on here, but let, I'm going to try to simplify it. Um, the, the, the preacher returns to this idea of comparing covenants. The old covenant under Moses and the new covenant under Christ. Because his hearers are tempted to return to the old one. They're tempted to not heed the voice of God. Verse 25 says that. Don't not heed the voice of God. And to make this comparison, to kind of finish his argument, he compares two mountains, Sinai, by implication, and Zion. Sinai from verses 18 through 21, and then Mount Zion from 22 to 24. Um, 
he, he brings up Zion because he says, you have not come. For you have not come to, sorry, Sinai. You have not come to Sinai. Now, what was Sinai? Sinai is the place where God inaugurated the old covenant under Moses in Exodus 19, okay? And here he describes basically what happens in Exodus 19, which is a really terrifying and dramatically so uh, terrifying scene. Um, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg no further messages be spoken. Notice that. God comes down on a mountain and the response is terror. This is old covenant. To the point where they're saying, stop talking. Whoa. So afraid of God's revelation, they were, they were begging him to stop. Verse 20, they couldn't endure. The order, if even a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned. And then it says, even Moses trembled with fear. What he's communicating is that Sinai in the old covenant was a place of darkness, terror, and gloom. Um, Sinai was a very vivid description of how distant and far the people were from God. So when God came near to the people, it was a dramatic illustration of you're wicked. You can't come near this God. If you even touch the mountain where this God dwells, you'll die. Whoa. And they were all terrified, okay? But then he turns and says really beautifully in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. So he's telling them, you haven't gone there but you have come to Zion. Zion, the mountain in Jerusalem, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festival gathering. Here he's talking about a a heavenly dwelling. I'll tell you what that means in a second. But look at the description. It's, It's totally the opposite, isn't it? It's a stunningly beautiful description of this mountain. Um, It's, it's, Far from this scene of terror in Exodus 19, it's a scene of like Revelation 5 where everyone's, the, the angels are worshiping, the, the sea of people are worshiping. Um, all the church, well, look at the description. He says, uh, you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn, firstborn those are Christians, enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all and of the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant. Okay, notice how contrasted this is. One scene at Sinai is stay away, terrifying, stop talking. The other is a party, isn't it? I mean, it's like the gates are open, you hear the music, you run in and you see, and these angels are like, what's up? They're flying around and all of the Christians are just worshiping and praising. And notice the language. Remember in Sinai, he says, don't you come near. Touch the mountain, you die. If even a bird lands on the mountain, it's dead. Did you notice here, he says, you've come to God and to Jesus? Access, access. So they've come into the presence of God without fear, awe and reverence. We'll see that at the end. Reverence and awe, that, that's fear, yes, but not this terrifying of stop talking, get away fear of reverential awe of joy. So Sinai is communicating distance from God and terror of God. Zion is communicating nearness to God and joy in his presence. What a contrast. Now, one is a physical mountain, Sinai. It's a dark scene and a reminder of their brokenness. The other is a, is a spiritual or it's a, an eternal heavenly mountain where the gates are swung open and... Jesus, as the mediator of a new covenant, has uh, given us access. Which means, and guys, this is just the gospel here, where we were sinners who could not approach God, but because of Jesus, he's made a way for us to enter the gates of heaven. So if you are a sinner who you haven't come to Jesus, guess, guess what mountain you're at. Guess what relationship you've got. Fear, terror, judgment. But if you turn to Jesus in faith, you have access to that festal gathering. What a blessing. What a blessing. He'll say that in verse 28. Look at verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving this kingdom, the one we've come to. But before he says that, he gives another warning. This preacher likes warnings in verse 25. 
See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. This is a warning that we're very familiar with. We saw it in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 10. The, the preacher will often say, um, if, if you should have listened to that voice, how much more should you listen to this voice, right? If you listen to Moses, you should listen to Jesus. And he says it again here. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. If they didn't escape when God warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. This is going back to Israel and the judgment that that God brought on them for rejecting him. But really, it's the appeal that I would just make to you again, which we've been making for, what, eight or nine weeks now. Don't reject this gospel. Don't. Don't. Jesus is offering you rescue and glory. And whether you reject this gospel, see, here's the interesting thing. Like, whether you reject this gospel for self-righteous legalistic religion, where you go, no, 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 I'm going to go back to earning my own way. Well, that's foolish. But even if you reject this gospel just for, just for nothing, uh, no other gospel except the gospel of self-pleasure, that's, don't reject this gospel. This is a message of salvation. Don't turn from it. And then he says something really interesting. Look at verse 26. At that time, he shook the earth. That was Sinai. When God came down uh, on Sinai, the earth trembled. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will not shake, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, verse 27, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things cannot be shaken may remain. This is where Joey's going to come explain. Just kidding, again. What he's trying to say here, I believe in essence, is this. The old covenant had so much physical. There's a physical mountain. There's a physical temple, physical sacrifices. But they're temporary and passing. And they were pointing to something that is eternal. The new covenant is us entering into the eternal kingdom. A kingdom that even though when God returns in Christ to shake the universe, and all the earth is burned with fire, in the final judgment, this kingdom is not shaken. When all that is passing will be burned, only what cannot be shaken will remain, the new heavens, the new earth, the new paradise, which which all of this has been leading toward, the restored heavens and earth, where we will dwell with God and he will dwell with us, sin being banished, united with our maker. And so he concludes, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. In other words, don't go back to the physical kingdom which will be shaken, which will be done away with. But come to the finality, the culmination, the kingdom of God that that is offered to us and, and be grateful for it. And the only response is to worship God with reverence and awe. And, and then he throws in, oh, by the way, for our God is a consuming fire. Friends, this is to make us profoundly aware of his grace, of this salvation, of this covenant that we have in Christ. Why would you trade anything? Any deliverance from temporary pain, any momentary fleeting pleasure, any removal even of of God's discipline, why would you trade anything for this eternal, unshakable kingdom that is yours in Christ? That, that kingdom that we will enter into. We, 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 we are so distracted, but you, re- you realize that the eternal kingdom, we, we will walk on the new heavens and the new earth in, in perfected bodies, I- enjoying the fruit of creation with no sin, no contamination, no death, no pain. God will dwell among us We'll enjoy perfect communion with our creator as we were designed to be. 
Christian, that's the reality you're looking toward. You believe that, don't you? H- have you allowed the distractions of sin and the temptations and persecution? And Have you allowed your mind to become so temporally focused that you, you've forgotten that? How glorious that will be when the creation will no longer groan, when there will be no more brokenness, when you will live in Edenic paradise with your Savior. Tell me one thing on this earth that this world has to offer worth giving that up for. That's what he's saying. And so Christianity is an unshakable faith in an unshakable kingdom. Look at those who went before you. Look at the one who went before you. Sitting at the right hand of the Father was a greater joy than escaping the cross for Jesus. And he did that so that you could join him. You realize that? He endured the shame so you could join him in glory.